Not within a thousand years would man ever fly. It's what Wilbur Wright told his brother two years before their successful flight at Kitty Hawk. In this way, aviation has always been exceeding expectations. Aviation has had to fight an uphill battle to prove itself throughout its history. Today, we might not think much of it, but it's a wonder we've made it this far. It's important to understand the history of aviation and the journey it's taken to get where it is today. I would like to let you in on a bit of that history. Be forewarned, however. The history of aviation is rich and expansive, and there's no way for me to cover it all. Because of this, I surveyed my peers to see what aspects of, or eras of aviation are of most interest to you. And I did my best to put more focus on those eras. I also allowed my own interests to influence what I spent the most time on. Because of these things, I will spend the most time on the early eras of aviation and World War II. Outside of that, I will also talk on World War I, the Cold War, and a bit about the jet age. All of these diverse eras of aviation were made possible by a desire for flight and the ambition of mankind. This ambition may be visualized through the famous myth of Icarus, the boy who flew too close to the sun. Icarus is one of many ancient examples of humanity's fascination with flight. I also think it's representative of the curiosity and passion that was felt towards the idea of human flight. There were, there were countless historical examples of flight and attempts towards it, but only a few were important for the advancement of aviation. One of the earliest of these advancements were made by Leonardo da Vinci, all the way back in the 1400s. Da Vinci was the first of many pioneers to make designs imitating flying animals, especially bats, such as that. One of his theoretical flying machines was operated by having the pilot lay down in the center of it and crank a pedal to make the wings flap. More, more remarkably was his proposed helicopter design, which for the 1400s was impressively close to a real helicopter. Further proving Da Vinci's genius, the next important pioneer came over 300 years later, and he was certainly important, hence the fact that he's referred to as both the father of aviation and the father of the airplane. Sir George Cayley made many discoveries essential to eventually achieving heavier than air flight. In his study on aerial navigation, he defined both fundamental aerodynamics and fundamental aspects of an airplane, including the curvature of the wings, the need for both lateral and horizontal controls, and the importance of reducing drag, and even more on top of that. Through these principles, he designed but did not build the world's first airplane. He also built the world's first full-size glider, which he once forced his driver to fly in. <laughs> Kaylee's important work took some time and some help to be popularized. That help came in the form of Alphonse Bernard. Bernard was a fantastic toy maker who worked to republish Kaylee's works as well as publish his own Principles of Flight. Along with this, he was the first to theorize the principle of inherent stability, which is the tendency of an aircraft to return to straight and level flight. One of his toy aircraft, the Plane 4, utilized much of Cayley's work and design. Another was a gift to the young Wright brothers by their father. Bernard made significant impact on aviation, though he lived an unfortunate life. He had a debil debilitating hip disease that killed his dream of being in the Navy, and he died of suicide, some say because of his frustrated frustration at life with a disability, others because of the spite he received from jealous toy makers. Unsurprisingly, he wasn't the only aviator whose life ended in tragedy. Otto Lilienthal was known as the Flying Man because during his lifetime, he took over 2,000 glider flights. On top of that, he studied the aerodynamics of birds, writing bird flight as the basis of aviation in 1889. He designed many gliders, a small engine, and was a member of the Aeronautical Society of Great Britain. When Lilienthal met his tragic demise, in a glider, cla glider crash in 1896, his last words were, sacrifices must be made. I believe that in his 
own opinion, he would believe that his sacrifices were worth it. People were shocked about Lilienthal's death because he was an expert of aviation and considered to be the most experienced pilot of his time. How could he, of all people, have crashed? Wilbur Wright sought to answer these questions. He wrote to the Smithsonian requesting any and all information on manned flight already known. Using Lilienthal's data, the Wrights constructed a kite in 1899, which they used to test the principles of propulsion, lift, and balance. Also with this kite, the Wright brothers tested their idea of wing warping. Wing warping was essentially the precursor to what is modern day ailerons and flaps, which are used to balance an aircraft. For the Wright brothers, this meant simply tilting one wing down and the other up. In 1901, the Wright's glider had an unsuccessful flight, which prompted them to question the Leonthal's data. Because of this, they decided to, to conduct their own research with a wind tunnel. This data eventually became the most detailed data on aircraft wings in the world at the time. With this new data, their 1902 glider performed much better. Finally, in 1903, they turned their attention to heavier than air flight. They began creating a propulsion system with the help of their employee, Charlie Taylor. Uh, finally, on December 17, 1903, they made a sustained flight of 59 seconds. The airplane was born. Still, there was a long way to go to perfect the Wright Flyer, which they succeeded in 1905 with the Wright Flyer 3. It was initially very similar to Wright Flyers 1 and 2, but it crashed in July of that year, which convinced them to make some changes. By October 5th, 1905, it was clear they'd made the right choice. Wilbur Wright flew over 24 miles in 39 and a half minutes in what is now referred to as the world's first practical airplane, though that claim may be disputed. To us, there is no question that the Wright brothers were the first to fly in any way that matters, but this fact wasn't always so certain. The challengers to this title have their own stories worthy of hearing. In the early days of aviation, the Wright brothers took great care to protect their patents, which aviator Glenn Curtis didn't seem to care one bit about. When he made a sale to the United States military, Wilbur Wright sued him for patent infringement, which started the infamous patent wars. The Wright brothers won the suit, but Glenn Curtis set out proving that they were not the first to come up with the technology that flight was based upon. He did this by repairing an earlier design to prove that it would have worked, as well as highlighting earlier instances of flight. There are many of these instances, but here are a few. First is one of the earliest claims to heavier than air flight, with Clement Adair. Adair's flights were never a one-off deal. His earliest claim was in 1890 with the Eel, a steam-powered monoplane that allegedly flew 160 feet in October of 1890. His steam engine was unsustainable and couldn't fly for long, but that didn't stop him. By 1897, he was back at it with his prop-powered, bat-shaped Avion 3, which flew 300 meters according to two witnesses. Evidently, his flights were not sustained or controlled, so they don't count. This next flight was even less sustained and definitely not controlled. Richard William Pierce was an aviator from New Zealand who flew 50 yards on March 31st, 1903. While well, eyewitnesses corroborate this story, he himself said he did not fly before the Wright brothers, but it wouldn't have mattered since his flight wasn't controlled and he crashed into a fence. And the next claim was in within months of him. In August of 1903, Carl Jatho flew his biplane named the Jatho Dragon. He flew at 50 feet with multiple witnesses, but he only flew one foot above the ground. <laughs> this may have been caused by the ground effect, which is a phenomenon where an aircraft flying above the fixed surface experiences lower aerodynamic drag. This means that it likely was not a truly controlled and sustained flight. At the very least, this flight definitely happened, which is more than you can say for Gustav Whitehead. His flights are highly disputed. He has two alleged, alleged instances of flight. One in August of 1901, apparently at 2 a.m. with no witnesses. Another was of two flights on January 17th, 1902, over Long Island Sound. Through the years, his story, which had been featured in newspapers and magazines, changed a lot, meaning it was likely not very true. The last on this list is Alberto Santos Dumont, and he's different because he didn't fly before the Wright brothers and he doesn't claim to. Instead, the argument for him is that 
the Wright brothers didn't fly. <laughs> Basically, since the Wright brothers were did their flights in private and nobody saw them, nobody can really know for sure that they happened, whereas Santos Dumont flew in front of a crowd. Specifically, in 1906, he flew his 14, 14 bits in front of the International Aeronautic Federation, mistakenly giving him the first ever distance flight record, truly implying that he was the first in flight. Regardless of who flew first, the airplane was born. In its earliest years, it was little more than entertainment, only engaged by true fanatics. Finally, some direction and purpose came in the form of the First World War. At the beginning of the war, use of aviation was tentative. There was not much certainty as to how it would be used, and there wasn't much preparation. In the years prior, there had been limited expansion into military aviation, with Britain having the largest fleet of over 300 aircraft. The question was, how would they use them? On September 22, 1914, four planes of the Royal Naval Air Service set out to bomb airship hangars. Representative of the early days of World War I, it went awry. Only one plane reached the target and none of the bombs went off. <laughs> Bombing wasn't the main use of planes, however. That was reconnaissance. Eventually, reconnaissance planes of enemy sides would spot each other in the air, prompting them to carry pistols and fire at each other. <laughs> they would get into intense battles called dogfights. Slowly, firearms progressed from pistols to machine guns, which required their own new technology. From October 1915 to March 1916, the Germans excelled at this. As they progressed to mounted machine guns, it was important to accommodate them. The Germans did this best with the Fokker Eindecker. In its timed interrupter, which allowed the machine gun to be mounted behind the propeller without shooting the blades. This ushered in the Fokker Scourge, a time of German air dominance until the Allies could catch up to their technology. Also in the Germans' favor was the unofficial ACE system that had been created. An ACE was a pilot that shot down five enemy aircraft. In the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen shot down 80, the most of anyone in World War I. He was a member of the fighter squadron JASTA II until January 19, when he shot down his 16th airplane. He was put in charge of JASTA 11, and in celebration, he painted his plane an albatross biplane, though he also flew in Fokker type planes like this one, a bright red, garnering the title the Red Baron. World War II convinced governments of the usefulness of a World War I, sorry, convinced governments of the usefulness of aviation in war, but it had still not been proven useful or practical to the general public. In the aftermath of World War I, there were plenty leftover planes as well as freshly made aviators with not a lot to do. This sparked the dangerous pastime of barnstorming. At this point in history, there were no real jobs for pilots, but they had found a passion for flight during World War I. Using surplus from World War I, pilots created their own version of a traveling circus, with daredevils walking on wings or even having tennis matches in the air. <laughs> this was made possible especially by the surplus airplane of the JN-4 Jenny, which was a World War I training plane. During the war, almost 7,000 of these planes had been created. It was used for many things which bolstered aviation, including, of course, barnstorming. Another thing it helped promote was the brand new air mail program, considering it was used in the first flight. On May 15, 1918, the first mail flight took place. Like many firsts in aviation, it was messy. There were two pilots, one taking off from DC 